is my, my research talk, and uh, we have this famous quote from an Israeli movie when someone tells a guy, you win a competition by starting as fast as you can and then accelerating, right? So that's how statisticians give research talks, but I try not to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so in some sense, uh, uh, maybe a role that statisticians have and uh, make it's oh. where is it? You need the microphone. Oh. But the problem is it doesn't okay. fly very well. You have to grip it very well. Okay. So there's no I just took oh, the not even. <laughs> Switch it like this. Okay? Okay, so uh, there's this. Uh, there's probably this uh, love-hate, maybe mostly hate, relationship between statisticians and, and scientists uh, in general. Uh, and maybe a nice illustration of this is, uh, is this nice uh, uh, Dilbert comics that's not about the relationship between uh, statisticians and, and scientists, but I think it captures a lot of the elements of the relationship. <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, people just can't <laughs> help themselves uh, do things that are not statistically valid. Uh, and uh, we sort of uh, uh, try to guard uh, against this. And uh, uh, so I think, it's a, I think it's a good analogy. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to be talking is, I I'll give some background uh, that's probably everyone is familiar with, but just to make sure we, uh, we're on the same page about multiple hypo hypothesis testing, and how using public databases is actually a special and, and particularly uh, interesting uh, instance of that problem. Uh, then I'll talk about our work on the idea of quality preserving database, the sort of the uh, the fundamental paper presenting the idea is actually this relatively old paper, and I'm probably going to concentrate on that for this talk. And then we have some sort of more complex statistical methodology coming out of that, uh, which uh, we'll see uh, if we get to. OK, so basically, what's a multiple hypothesis testing scenario? Uh, we can think of uh, having all kinds of scientific work going on before, but then we end up with what we can think of as just a bunch of p-values. And we put these p-values uh, through some procedure, and we get a bunch of decisions, which are basically acceptance or rejection of the, of the nulls. And a, a multiple testing procedure guarantees that some measure of false discovering is being controlled by our procedure, but uh, by our way of uh, sort of uh, doing statistical hypothesis testing. Uh, and uh, for example, one traditionally uh, very important one is the family-wise error rate. So that's uh, we're going to divide to uh, denote by R the rejection decisions and by V the uh, uh, the incorrect rejections. So two nulls that are getting rejected. So R is the sum of the R's is how many hypotheses we reject overall, and V is the sum of the V's is how many false rejections we have overall of true nulls. So family-wise error rate is we want to control the probability of making even one false discovery, right? And what's a false discovery? False discovery is an abstract notion, but it's really a science paper that has to be retracted, right? That's what we should think about when we talk about a false discovery. Or probably not a science paper, but maybe it gets accepted to science. Uh, so uh, family-wise error rate is we want to control the probability of making even one false discovery out of our entire corpus of tested hypotheses, right? And as we all know, the Bonferroni correction, which is just taking this alpha level that we want to control family-wise error rate and dividing it by the number of hypotheses, uh, controls family-wise error rate without any assumption on the dependent structure of the p-values. They can be dependent in any way, and we still control family-wise error rate. Uh, a more advanced thing uh, that uh, probably everybody here knows as well is the idea of false discovery rate. So if we look at familiar error rate, we might say this is very, very conservative, right? Because if we make 100 discoveries, we might be willing to also have a few false discoveries, given that we have 100. If we have zero, we don't want our only discovery to be false. But if we have many discoveries, then we, we don't mind if, because our science paper is going to be about 100 discoveries, and then if 
Five of them are actually not true discoveries. It's not the end of the world. So that's the idea of FDR, right? We now want to control the expected value of false discoveries to total discoveries. And we have this complication dealing with the case of zero discoveries that's not critical for our purpose. Uh, and for that, we have the Benjam Benjamini Hochberg FDR procedure and some other procedures. And this is very good because as scientists, uh, our main goal is, is to publish in science, right? And not to control false discovery. So now we have a much more, uh, a much more lenient measure that is still uh, well-defined and rigorous. So we would like to employ this measure and uh, allow ourselves to make some false discoveries and lo as long as we make many uh, true discoveries uh, to go with them. We are guaranteed to have, in expectation, uh, most of our discoveries are guaranteed to be uh, true discoveries. So we have the uh, Benjamin Hochberg for this. Uh, and this less, less conservative measure, so more discoveries, and that clearly explains the, the great success of this uh, uh, measure. Uh, okay, so uh, probably this crowd doesn't need the detailed example, but let me just go quickly through that. So we have a, a million hypotheses uh, in a GWAS, uh, and if we test at level 0 0.05, as probably the community discovered by, uh, by uh, bad experience, then we already expect to get 50,000 discoveries, right? Because that's 0 0.05 times a million. So, and what's 0 0.05? 0 0.05 meaning that uh, uh, remember that the p-values have a uniform distribution under the null. So setting a threshold 0.05, we a priori expect 5% of true null hypothesis to be rejected. That means if we are testing, we're doing a permutation, and we know that the phenotype has no relationship to genetics, we still expect to make about 50,000 false discoveries. So that's clearly a bad idea. Uh, and that's why typically the, the threshold that the community adopts today, and to some extent maybe the origin of this threshold is already forgotten, is 5 times 10 to the minus 8, which is implicitly a Bonferroni correction for a million tests. Okay? Uh, and one thing interesting that, uh, that has gone through the history of uh, GWAS is that still many findings do not replicate. And the potential cause is publication bias. And how can we think about publication bias? If, we, if each one of us does Bonferroni, that means each one of us has 5% chance of making a false discovery. Now there's 100 of us uh, doing GWAS, then five of us are still going to have false discoveries. Right? And if we have very few hits, then it might well be that some of them are still false discoveries, even at this threshold. Right? Because in some sense, we should be correcting for if we want to really control false discovery, we should be correcting for all the hypotheses that everyone is testing and not each one separately for their own hypothesis. So uh, uh, this very famous paper uh, uh, tried to ask the question. So we, we, we now have this protocol and we have this problem. So, uh, so one thing that's, uh, that, that's a, a remedy for this is this uh, a custom or practice that you have to replicate your finding before it can be published, right? So now the question is, can the replication also be actually if 100 people make 100? So let's assume that there's no signal in GWAS, uh, not a good assumption, but 100 people uh, uh, do their, or 1,000 people do GWASs, 50 of them get false discoveries, they try to replicate at level 0.05, so about three of them will succeed in replication uh, uh, due to basically another independent false discovery, right? So th these people asked the question uh, in 2003 uh, of whether looking over a large corpus of uh, genetic association studies, uh, uh, can we uh, say that over all replications, there's actually clear evidence that, th that they are not due to false discovery, but we can believe that at least some signal exists and some uh, replications are actually true discoveries, right? And so they did some uh, uh, pretty careful uh, of overall uh, 301 studies and 25 associations. Uh, so some of them were repeatedly tested again and again, and some of them were successful replications and some were unsuccessful replications. So this ended up in 11 successful replications out of their corpus, and they did some calculations saying that if there's an additional corpus of about 1,500 unpublished replications, up unpublished attempted replications, then these replications 
could actually be attributed to chance and be consistent with actually false replications, not only false discoveries to start with. Uh, and they said there's clear evidence for fewer unpublished studies. So overall, we conclude a very weak conclusion, but nonetheless positive, that some signal exists somewhere in this entire uh, corpus. OK? Uh, OK. So uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know the details of this. Uh, this slide was prepared a long time ago. I don't remember the, the <laughs> details. But uh, so probably they were not the strongest. Th they were just, so the, the criterion is this we succeed in replication, right? When we try to replicate, we, if we do it properly, we forgot the strength of association in the original finding. Right. They should be. Yeah. But so okay. So replication also worries about other things, which are that actually our analysis was incorrect the first oh, time, yeah. right? And and then by in by that respect, it may be that very strong asso associations don't get replicated. Okay. But this is not our concern here. Uh, okay, so also I don't have to conf co uh, 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 convince this audience that it's an interesting <laughs> uh, uh, sort of domain to think about public databases. Here are just a few examples which are maybe a bit obsolete. So the idea is that there is a database that is a common resource for a community. Okay? So uh, this obviously is very widespread in, uh, in bioinformatics. And the question is how should we be thinking or how can we take this uh, mode of work where there's a common database and all kinds of different research done on this database, how can we take advantage of this mode of work to, better, to do a better job of controlling false discovery and, and doing valid scientific research, right? So that's sort of the basic uh, scientific question that we try to deal with. Uh, okay, so one thing that we have to worry about is that if we want to now say now we have this common data resource and we're going to take responsibility for all the science that's being done on this common data resource, then we have to worry about several things. One thing is that the research groups are uncoordinated, so uh, uh, each one tries to do the best science they can and control their own false discovery. Uh, the other one is that we don't know how it's going to be used in the future. Right? And these methods that we talked about, see a set of uh, p-values and make decision about the entire a set of uh, hypotheses at once, whereas a database like this is supposed to remain useful for future unpredictable use, right? So, uh, so in some sense, uh, uh, this is the sequential nature and this is the uncoordinated nature of the research being done. So one thing we definitely want is for our procedure to be sequential. So each time it sees one p-value or several p-values, several hypotheses being tested, it makes a decision on what it saw but we still want to guarantee some overall measure of false discovery control, right? So this is the idea of a sequential procedure. That uh, uh, ideally we want to keep this useful either for a time period or maybe uh, for, for infinite use and still control overall false discovery on the entire uh, corpus of research being done on this database, right? So uh, this seems like a very tough task. Uh, and it's very tough in the sense that it makes the science very difficult, but mathematically it's not difficult to design, yeah. So that means if you're late in the game, then it's harder for you to publish, right? Well, it, should, it, 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 it will be when we first talk about it, and our goal will be to remove this limitation, that it gets harder for you to publish as, you, as it becomes later in the game, right? So that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. So let's just see this example of why it gets harder for you later in the game. So this is a well-known way for controlling family-wise error, error rate, which is basically just taking Bonferroni and making it adaptive. Bonferroni is taking our alpha and dividing it equally between all hypotheses. If we don't know future use, then we cannot divide equally because uh, we may have an infinite sequence. So the idea is to divide it in some other way that guarantees that the sum of the rejection probabilities under the null is bounded by alpha, right? by the overall alpha. So we might give the first hypothesis 0.01. So that first hypothesis is going to be tested at level 0.01. The second hypothesis gets some other level, the third one, and so on. As long as we uh, maintain this invariant that the sum of the levels is bounded by this overall alpha, we're controlling family-wise error rate. Wha what's the problem, as David said, that someone who comes uh, hypothesis number 1,000 under any reasonable uh, way of allocating values is going to have a very tiny threshold. And why is it bad to have a tiny threshold? 
because as scientists, my argument is that the scientists should not actually care at all about the threshold at which their tests are being performed. But what should scientists care about if they want to publish? They should care about power, right? Power is what happens if your uh, scientific hypothesis is actually true. And there is, there is a discovery to be made here. What does it mean to have a very small threshold? It means that you have low power to make your discovery and publish your science paper. So you should care about thresholds, not because having a low threshold is bad, but because it gives you low power to make your discovery. So this is problematic in the sense that people who come later are going to have very low power to make discoveries, right? As, as David noted. So uh, as we said, as levels decrease, which they must do if you want to maintain this invariant, the power also decreases. So in some sense, the earlier users are wasting our data, are using up our data, OK? So our goal is to try to amend this in such a way that the earlier users will not be using up the data, and the later users can also enjoy uh, this resource, OK? So uh, uh, basically, we want the user to not lose power by arriving later, while still controlling uh, some measure of false discovery. And so there's two ways to not decrease power. One is to not decrease level, which is impossible if we want to maintain this uh, invariant. The other one is to add, power, add samples, increase the data size. Why is that relevant? Because uh, as we learned in STATS 101, if you increase the data size, you would get more power at the same level, right? So if my data size increases by a lot, I may get more power at a much lower level than I had for a smaller data size. So this might actually have some hope. OK, now, so basically our problem is to design how one should be paying for using the data. We want to guarantee power to the next users, but we also want to keep the costs controlled or bounded. So if to use our, our data, you would have to double its size every time so that future users can have uh, uh, power. So the first person will have to pay 1,000, the, the equivalent of, uh, of 1,000 samples. The second one might pay 2,000 and the costs would be diverging, that's not a good, that's not a practical scheme, right? So we want to uh, uh, guarantee future power and keep the costs bounded. That's basically our fundamental goal in designing uh, uh, the schema. Okay, so let's just uh, have a schematic view of how this might work. So that we have again, so we still want to control family-wise error, the simplest thing by doing alpha spending. So the first user would get some level, but the user will pay, or in some other way, we're going to add samples to our data set after performing the test, uh, the second one, and so on. Uh, and every time we do a test, we're going to increase our database in a way that guarantees, <coughs> sorry, that guarantees power to future users, right? That's the key. We want to guarantee the power, uh, uh, we want to guarantee the power and bounded cost, both of them, for future users. Okay, so let's look at an, implement at, at an implementation example, which is basically a sort of a proof of concept that this thing can be done in practice, accomplishing uh, uh, our goals. So uh, let's assume we have a, a stream of normal tests. Each one of them has an effect size and some power requirement. Uh, and when the test arrives, uh, we have some n sample in our database. So we have this uh, uh, simple calculation. We have to find C such that this uh, uh, is going to be sufficient level for obtaining the required power. And this is going to be the cost uh, for using the database. Either give us C samples, or if, you don't, if we don't trust you, you're going to pay us, you're going to pay the database to acquire an additional C samples uh, to do your test, okay? And what does this guarantee? This guarantees that we can serve an infinite stream with bounded costs. So if you have some effect size that you want to test at some level, yeah, uh, sorry, if you have an effect size that you want to get some power for, the level of the test is not the scientist's concern at all. The scientist has some effect size in mind and they want some power for it. So if they test it today, they're going to pay something. If they come uh, test number a million, they're going to pay something. So we guarantee that this cost is bounded. It does not diverge as you wait. And in fact, we want a much stronger property, right? We want the costs to be decreasing. Why do we want the costs to be decreasing? Uh, 
because uh, that means that if you have a lot of money, you can be the first one to use the data set, the database, right? And the ones with not a lot of money, if they wait long enough, they're going to be able to use the database. So we cannot guarantee decreasing costs. We can only guarantee bounded costs. But actually, in practice, when you simulate this, you get decreasing costs almost invariably. OK, and the normal is just an example. It's not important to be normal. There are some properties that we need from the, from the distributions, but practically all um, sort of generalized uh, 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 linear model family uh, or exponential family, all of them would comply with our uh, conditions. And in, so we guarantee a bounded cost, but in practice, the costs are diminishing. So let's just see. Uh, so what do I mean in practice? That we have this thing that we have to calculate, right? That depends in, in, in some complex way on the entire stream of effect sizes and powers that are, that are desired. So uh, uh, we can just simulate, uh, basically, effect uh, sizes and, and, and uh, uh, required powers. And we see here uh, uh, the decreasing costs uh, for different types of tests. So. Uh, uh, Basically, the, uh, the squares are what I talked about, uh, uh, testing a normal mean with known variance. But we see that, in practice, the costs for all tests uh, uh, are decreasing. And because we are maintaining this alpha spending invariant, we are guaranteed to control family-wise error rate whenever we use this uh, uh, schema. OK, so to summarize this sort of basic UPD idea, uh, we want to control false discovery in this unpredicted future use case. And what we've done is we've basically add, um, added a management layer to the database that's responsible for the validity uh, of the tests being done. And you're going to pay per use with either samples or more likely the cost of sample acquisition to, uh, uh, to enhance the database. And the, imp the important thing. First of all, we can now serve an infinite series of requests without loss of power. But uh, it's not written here. But the most important thing is that the cost is bounded. And in practice, the cost is decreasing, which actually means that uh, we have something that is potentially uh, usable. Can you give us some intuition of what happens and makes it decreasing? Because in principle, you know, the intuition is that it should increase right. unboundedly. The size increases unbounded, but the cost is decreasing. The derivative of the size is decreasing, mm -hmm. right? And that's right. related to the, to the basic fundamentals of how power calculations work, of how okay. tails of distributions work, okay. the dependence on sample size uh, that's favorable. OK? Uh, yeah? So you can have a fixed size data set. There is no option of actually acquiring more samples. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we'll talk, hopefully we'll get to talking about FDR control. And under FDR control or MFDR, which we control here, if you're lucky, you might be able to do infinite testing on a finite size database. Basically, if excellent science is big, right? Because FDR, the idea is that we want to control the percent of false discoveries out of total discoveries, right? So if we have only great scientists in our community and they continuously come up with false nulls uh, or true alternatives, then they're probably making, constantly making rejections by virtue of the great science, then you could keep a, 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 a finite size database uh, infinitely useful, not in this scheme. In this scheme, it has to increase with the uh, use. Uh, OK, so we are using alpha spending to control family-wise error rate, but we're compensating for the e decrease in alpha by the increase of the data size. And the most important point here is that uh, this shifts the focus of what scientists are concentrated on from worrying about p-values to not knowing anything about p-values, worrying about effect size and power. Right? These are the only uh, 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 coins that sh we should be worried about. There's effect size, power, and cost. These are the only dimensions of the interaction of the scientist with the data set. Uh, and, and this is important because what happens if I show the scientist, what's going to happen to scientist number 1,000 or 1 million in the, uh, in the stream of tests? 
So scientist 1000 is going to be, te his hypothesis is going to be tested at level 10 to the minus 20 probably, or 10 to the minus 30. And the scientist is going to say, this is by no means a reasonable, I, I have five hypotheses, why should they be tested at 10 to the minus 30, right? So as soon as the, as the, uh, as the scientist sees that the p-value is 10 to the minus 10, but the hypothesis is not rejected, it's going to be a big problem. So uh, this can only work if the scientists don't worry about p-values. They worry about effect size and power. And my strong opinion is that this is the only thing that scientists should care about. But this might be uh, disputed by people with p-value 10 to the minus 15 who don't get to publish their uh, paper. <laughs> yeah. It actually came to my mind when you were saying that you know, there are, in a sense, better experiments and worse experiments. In this, there's no better and worse. In this schema, there's no better and worse because we're controlling family wise zero rate under any dependence. And no matter how, if you want to pay, you can do whatever stupid things you want under this schema. Uh, so and it's not going to change the cost for future users. Maybe I'm trying to ask them. The calculations you made and the simulations you made to generate these decreasing costs, as the, the data comes in, is it all generated in your simulations by the same? Underlying distribution. Absolutely, yes. Which is like saying, though, that the data is all the same quality. Yes, the data is the same quality. The hypothesis can be any quality. Okay, okay. The right. data has so to data be the same quality. same quality. Data has to be the same so quality. So, in principle, for this to work, it's not, it, there should be a centralized experiment, uh, uh, experimental facility, because any scientist coming with 10 more data values, the 10 more data values that a person contributes could be very different in quality that than them. That's true. I'm being provocative here. That's so true. Uh, so here, here's this point. You can pay per use with samples if we have some way of knowing that your samples are of the right quality. Or more likely, you pay for the cost of sample acquisition. All right. All right. Uh, and one thing that maybe this community uh, uh, is more comfortable with than other communities is the idea that you pay for everything, right? So in this case, you pay for using uh, uh, the public software. database. Not for software, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, so here's this uh, uh, summaries, uh, summarizing uh, uh, this idea. The idea is that there's now these two separate entities, the, the researcher and the person responsible for the database, who might be a researcher as well of the relevant community. So uh, as, a, as a researcher, you should say what your null hypothesis is and what your test statistic is. And then you should say what effects, what power do you want at what effect size? Right? And that leads to a cost calculation. So basically, or you can say, I have some effect size in mind and I have an X amount of money. What power can I get for this combination? Right? Any two determine the third in this uh, schema. Uh, you negotiate and then you decide on, uh, on some combination of effect size and power and how much it's going to cost. Uh, then uh, you pay the cost. Uh, uh, and you actually don't need to acquire the samples, if I remember correctly, before performing the test. Uh, and then once uh, the database performed the test, you get the result and you publish uh, uh, if significant. So you only get a reject, non-reject decision, but now you publish and you are protected uh, uh, against publication bias. So you can say, my result was obtained on this database with a family-wise error rate control of 0.2 across all usage of this database for by past and future researchers, right? Okay, so let's do a simple use case. So, so one use case that I think is relatively uh, uh, easily made is actually used as a replication server. Okay, so some, some uh, big research communities like, uh, uh, say, type 2 diabetes is a good example. Uh, so they all have to replicate their findings, right? Each one does the research on their own data, but if they want to publish it, they have to replicate it. So we could actually have a replication server that's like owned by the di Diabetes Type 2 consortium, meaning we could actually solve the, the also the problem of uh, uh, costing money and so on, because we can say anyone who wants to test and is a member of the consortium can test three or five replications, and that's already included in the cost of being part of the consortium. Uh, and we have, we have this additional mechanism for generating additional data as part of the consortium. And with type 2, it's probably not a problem to get more cases and, and uh, controls. Okay, so now uh, uh, we have to, to convince 
uh, the consortium that it's a good idea to have this replication server, this common resource, right? So uh, we, can, we can look at different scenarios for doing replication. So everyone who has a discovery can just say, I'm going to collect some more data and replicate on that, right? So that's typically going to require hundreds of samples. And we still have publication bias across replications, as we discussed before. Uh, or we can replicate uh, on public data, which is, uh, uh, requires us to do no uh, cost, costs nothing, no samples, but there's severe publication bias, right? Because everybody is actually replicating on the same data, so any problem in this data is going to be, uh, uh, for example, any, uh, uh, any false discovery on this data is likely to be repeated by many different people who try to uh, uh, use this data. Now for the QPD, we know that we are protected from publication bias in replication. And as we saw in our graph, under reasonable assumption, uh, after our data has grown, it's going to just cost a few samples. Uh, and we can do calculation for this uh, representative setting to say that the typical cost is under five samples for replication. Okay, so, uh, so uh, that's the case to be made why it's a good idea uh, for a replication server. Okay, so uh, questions to this point? Yeah? Are you familiar with David Balding's Bayesian argument for the 10 to the minus big threshold? Uh, no. Oh. We can talk about it offline. Uh, Did you ever try to classify the NIH? Uh, I, had, I had some uh, conversations with people who are uh, sort of related to these big uh, uh, public databases uh, projects. And, and one thing, uh, I mean, there the are several problems with this. Uh, they claim it's going to be hard in terms of acceptance by the scientific community. The thing they worry about the most is probably the fact that the p-values are hidden from the researchers. Because somehow it's become the common, uh, uh, the common thing to look at p-values and say, judge the value of my discovery by how small the p-value is. And this, I mean, there's no problem reporting back the p-values. But, but it's a problem because uh, uh, if I report to someone back your p-value is 10 to the minus 20, but your hypothesis is not rejected, then it's going to be like a cultural problem. That there, there could be a learning curve. I'm wondering whether it could become acceptable that there's an additional cost implicit <coughs> in doing science, which the NIH may even try to put to support. Yeah, right? I agree. Which is to create this type of mechanism. I and agree, I so. You write your grant and you could ask for so many thousand dollars to be actually part of one of the consortia that does this. I agree. Thing. I agree. And, and, uh, and probably we, we were too easily discouraged by... Uh, uh, so I, I sort of uh, uh, maybe a little uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, vi viewing my role in a bit limited way as I put it out there and I'm not going to go to war on whether or not people use it. But uh, I mean, I think there's a lot that can be done in terms of uh, looking for adoption. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, true. You could actually figure out an adjustment uh, for each p-value based on the, but yeah. The second one where I think it would be hard to convince people to is because, hey, I'm not getting into the positive. That's <laughs> <the best. laughs> <laughs> and if, they, if it gives false positives, it's fine. <laughs> 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 positives in general. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure, yeah. I, I, I think the replication server is actually a very easy example because if it's, a, if it's a consortium, you can easily design it in such a way that it would be free of use, as long as the use is limited and it's growing in some organic way, and right? And it's a social cost. Yeah. This, for our community and more generally, especially for biomedical research, it is a social cost that maybe there could be an argument that it should be uh, uh, supported publicly. Uh -huh. uh. Good. I'm happy about that uh, view. <laughs> Confounding. Yeah. Right, so confounding is like saying the distribution of p-values under the null is not uniform 0, 1. Uh, and I mean, I, I think it's a major concern, but kind of orthogonal to what we're trying to do. Well, Once you go to the NIH, you, I agree you have to worry about it. Okay? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I, I agree you have, you have to worry about it. So that means that the database administrator is actually not an administrator, right? The database administrator is like the head of the uh, uh, type 2 diabetes replication consortium and they are scientifically responsible for the, uh, that, that the relevant uh, null will be tested with distribution uniform 0, 1. Right? That's basically. Uh, right, right. So, so probably the mo the the easier uh, uh, sort of scientific mode is that the database is responsible for increasing the data and just charge money. Uh, and then the central uh, uh, entity is also responsible for the quality and uniformity of the data. But obviously, from a practical perspective, there's there's the several hurdles that we have to uh, get over. Uh, so I have to ask myself how much time do I have? Like 10 minutes? That's, uh, that's what you're not here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, just another piece of evidence. Uh, so, uh, so let's go quickly over uh, that uh, uh, second uh, half of the talk basically, which is dealing with a more advanced uh, sort of statistical uh, 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 version of this. Uh, so, so far we've talked about control controlling family-wise error rate, which is sort of the natural thing to do in a sequential manner. Uh, and our goal is to move to controlling FDR type measure and the, and the benefits are obvious, right? The benefits is sort of that if good science is being done on our database and rejections get, and hypotheses get rejected, then if we only want to control some FDR type measure, it should help us. Because uh, hypotheses are getting rejected uh, and something is controlled overall, meaning we can be more liberal because we, ag we, we allow some of the rejections to be false if there are many rejections, right? So uh, there's this very nice, uh, uh, pretty well-known paper from 2007 by Foster and Sign saying that uh, uh, there's a way to, con to sequentially control MFDR and uh, MFDR I'm introducing in the next uh, uh, slide. It's like a slightly different version of FDR. And what we do in our work is generalize, basically say it's not actually a single procedure, but a whole family of procedures for controlling MFDR sequentially. Uh, and that there's some variants of this f general family different from their variant that can be incorporated in a QPD. That means we can now have a QPD that controls MFDR, okay? And, and, and results in significantly induced, uh, uh, reduced costs. Okay, so let's talk about what FDR is. If you remember MFDR, if you remember FDR is the expectation of the ratio between V and R, and uh, MFDR is the ratio of the expectations. And uh, in many uh, uh, probability and stats 101 exams, uh, uh, it's clear that there's no difference between the expectation of the mean and the mean of the expectation, <laughs> uh, the expectation of the ratio and the ratio of the expectations, but in fact there is a difference. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and this is the thing uh, uh, we are controlling here. What we can say is that if the uh, numerator and the denominator both become reasonably large, then there's really not much difference between controlling the expectation of the ratio and the ratio of the expectation under some reasonable uh, Poisson model or so. So this is, uh, this is what we control. And in fact, there's been work in the last year showing uh, that, uh, that you can sequentially control FDR, which we, we did not know of and, and were not able to develop ourselves. And I think it's possible to embed variants of that into QPD and get an FDR controlling QPD. But this work is about controlling MFDR. So let's just see. Yeah. What's the point of the one minus alpha? It seems to be a small number. So well, if both are zero, it's undefined, right? Uh, so you have to worry about that. Uh, it's a very strange procedure. Yeah, it's like it's uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, so we do the same thing as we did with uh, alpha spending, but now we have a potential reward. So we test the first uh, hypothesis at some level. That's not what we took out of the wealth, but this uh, x over one plus x, uh, and we did not reject the null, so nothing happened. Now we keep on in the alpha spending way, uh, testing the second one, nothing happened. We test the third one, ah, we rejected it. Then in the FDR spirit, we get a reward and our pool fills back up, right? 
So this is basically the alpha investing. Uh, instead of alpha spending, we are alpha investing. And uh, sometimes we get lucky and we get back uh, uh, some uh, level. Uh, so that's basically just a formalization of this algorithm. Uh, and the generalization is that uh, you have a pool, you take something out of the pool, and you can translate it to different combinations of level and reward. So I want, uh, basically, this is, uh, uh, this is our result. This is the space of possible combinations that would still guarantee MFDR. So basically, I could say I want a lot of level. I want a, a, a high level, but potentially small reward, or I want a, I'm willing to tolerate a very low level, and I potentially can get a big reward and still control MFDR overall, right? So, uh, so this is basically uh, the algorithm, and, the, and this shows the uh, this uh, this shape is actually uh, shown by this theorem. As long as we are along this curve, uh, uh, we control overall MFDR. Uh, and now we can look at different generalized alpha investing procedure in light of this. So alpha investing is choosing some point on this curve. Alpha spending in with rewards, which is what we are going to be uh, uh, in putting into uh, uh, QPD, is a different point. And we have this notion we developed of optimality, which is this point in the curve. But I'm going to skip over that as well. Uh, we have this notion of expected reward optimal. Uh, and so what does it mean to be expected reward optimal? To be expected reward optimal means that you're getting the most bang for your buck by using this database, okay? So, uh, so basically we are saying uh, uh, let's do uh, uh, an infinite series of tests uh, and, uh, and we are going to be using all, uh, level 0.005 for all our tests, meaning our tests, our, uh, they, our pool is actually going to run out. It's not going to, we, we try to do an infinite test, but it's running out. We're not doing a QPD here, just showing the value of applying this sequential procedure in its optimal form. And basically what we want is to be able to run many tests and to be able to make true discoveries, right? So basically, these are the things we care about. So if we use the optimal procedure, we are able to run 40 tests on this database uh, and control MFDR. If we do alpha spending, we control family-wise error rate. We only do 10 tests. It's, uh, this is the Monferroni for 10. Uh, and if we do alpha investing, we, we get a few less tests. OK, so let's just put it into a QPD framework. Uh, so basically, we want to put this into the QPD, the infinite, infinitely useful uh, database, right? So we, we use one of the notions uh, of this, which is alpha spending with rewards, and put it into QPD. And what does it mean that we get rewards? It means that it's getting cheaper and cheaper to the database, right? And if we happen to be lucky and get a lot of rewards, it might become free to use the database. And when do we get a lot of rewards? If the science being done on our database is really good. Right? If we, the more science papers get published, the cheaper it becomes to, uh, uh, to use our database. Uh, and uh, that's debatable whether it's what's typical or not. But in some favorable cases, uh, it's going to decrease to zero, the cost of using the database. So here are some simulations. And basically, the key is that I have 10% false nulls, and I have reasonable power to reject the nulls. OK, that means that my, uh, it keeps replenishing my, uh, my QPD. Uh, and there's a lot of degrees of freedom here about different ways to assign costs and so on. Basically, uh, we have this very conservative way of doing it and uh, a very adventurous way of doing it. And basically, if you're conservative in the way you assign costs, they are decreasing nicely. If you're adventurous, meaning you're counting on, on getting uh, rejections in the future, right? Uh, then uh, your costs drop to zero and remain at zero with this sort of uh, favorable uh, simulation scenario. OK, so as I said, there's this now uh, uh, very recent work on controlling FDR sequentially. And I think it can be embedded within a, a QPD. And then we can control FDR instead of MFDR within the uh, QPD. So to summarize. Uh, it's not so new already, but it's a paradigm for public database management. 
uh, uh, we control false discovery and publication bias. We do not lose, lose power, but we augment the database size slowly. And the key is that we can do it slowly or uh, di diminishing costs. Uh, and this is what we talked about, whether or not it can be implemented in practice. Uh, so lots of the trends of recent years actually fit well with this, right? So both sharing and security and privacy, because now actually as long as we trust the database manager, the scientists don't need, don't get direct access to the data. They only send their hypothesis to be tested. So only the centralized database actually has access to the data. And that's critical for our sort of validity, but uh, uh, the side benefit is potentially privacy and security. Uh, there's this change in culture that there's no more p-values, only rejection or non-rejection decisions. Uh, and the culture, practical issues is what we discussed. Cultural acceptance of p-values, data quality, uh, and the possibility of gaming. I haven't discussed it. So the first scheme I showed uh, has no real possibility of gaming the system uh, because it doesn't assume independence between the hypothesis being tested. Whereas our MFDR control does assume a sort of not independence but almost independence. So, uh, uh, so that can be gamed potentially. How can you game a system that assumes? It's easy to see how you could game an MFDR system, right? Uh, you could game an MFDR system by, by testing spurious hypothesis that you know to the null to be false, right? If you have some, some consensus in the, com something everybody in the community knows, a null everybody knows to be false and you repeatedly test it, you get a, a free use and basically you make a, a useless true discoveries and a useful false discoveries if you game the system like this. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't really get to talk in detail about this general alpha, alpha investing uh, stuff. Okay, thanks. <laughs> we have time for more questions? <laughs> okay, uh, if it's my choice, there's no journal clubs today, we're going to be talking about QPD. <laughs> <laughs> So it, along along yeah, so this is, uh, uh, it absolutely does not support exploratory data analysis or, or adaptive uh, testing, right? You can have dependence, you cannot have adaptation because adaptation is sort of implicitly doing many more tests that, than you are doing in uh, practice. Uh, so that's why my example is a replication server where what you care about is that this thing remains pristine and is used only for that goal, right? Uh, and it's true that so basically scientists should still be doing exploratory analysis on their own data. But, the, but once they generate hypotheses, they can test them on the, uh, on the public data or, or this hidden public data, right? This joint resource. So one would need to have a parallel circuit for sharing data that can be used for exploratory sure. analysis. Sure, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, well, if you, of course, you can cheat by giving low s low quality data or. Not only low quality. Let's say that I gave my lab gave eighty percent of the data. Yeah. Then, then it should forget the data it gave, right? <laughs> it no, lo lo no longer has this data. Okay. Um, I I agree with the concern. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Sure, yeah, yeah, you can do, s I agree with you, you can do some calculations saying 
the, the proving that there's not too much contamination that each lab can achieve by uh, reusing its own data. That's true. But again, the, the clean scenario to me is this consortium where the sort of the, the, the joint data resource is uh, responsible for the data collection from the start in this scenario, right? Uh, it's these people coming together and saying we want to have our joint data resource and we build a mechanism for collecting data and curating the data and so on. Okay, thanks.